In this section, we'll take a look at spherical coordinates. This is the last of the new coordinate systems that we're doing in this chapter. Spherical coordinates are based on the radius of a sphere and the angle measure between the z-axis and the radius. And I do have a picture to show you because this is very hard to see. I also put some pictures in the larger PowerPoint, and there's pictures in the textbook as well, looking at how some of these things look. So like if I said r equals 3, then you would have a nice circle in polar coordinates. Well, you could pick a, a variable equals 3, and you'll end up with a sphere because the distance from the origin to a point will be that first variable. Now, spherical coordinates have the form of rho, phi, theta. And I'm going to have fun trying to draw some phi's on here that don't look like thetas. Rho is the distance from the origin to a point. The r is not on the xy plane. That's not the same thing as rho. The phi is the angle between the z-axis and the line that connects the origin to the point. And theta is the rotation on the xy plane. That theta is the same as in cylindrical coordinates. So take a look at what this looks like. All right, so you got your x and your y and your z-axis. The phi is the difference between the point on the origin and the point up here. So that's a length. That's a distance. The other two things are angle measures. The phi is the angle measure between the z-axis and that line that connects the origin to point P. And theta is on the xy plane. That's how far you're going over here. So there are conversions amongst them as to how you can get spherical coordinates back into xyz coordinates and vice versa. So if you want that distance z, that distance z is rho times the cosine of phi, right? all coming off of right angles. If you want the radius from the center to a point out here, it's going to be rho times the sine of phi. These values down here are triangles inside of triangles, so you're going to end up with multiple sets of angles, but then you can replace the rho sine phi with an r. Okay, so that's how they convert them. And that's what they look like. That rho, that funny looking p, we call that rho, is the distance between that origin point and the point that you have in spherical coordinates. All right, if this gives you a little bit of a way to go back and forth between the systems, the rho is x squared plus y squared plus z squared. So now you can start to see that spherical coordinates do have an advantage in that you can take a very complicated function and replace it with a single variable. All right, if you want to go from spherical to rectangular, then your x, y's, and z's become, in the first two cases, functions of both phi and theta. In the third case, that z is only a function of phi, because remember that theta lies only in the x, y plane. So what's the formula for triple integrals and spherical coordinates? Here's what it is. Instead of f of x, y, z, or f of r thetas, you're going to end up with f of rho phi theta times rho squared times the sine of phi d rho d phi d theta. Yikes. Look at your limits of integration. Your limits of integration for d rho are going to go from g to h, where both of those are functions. The other two are going to be constants, right? So your phi is an angle that goes from a to b. Your theta is an angle that goes from alpha to beta. So basically, the phi will tell you how far it's going to lean off of that z-axis, and that theta will tell you how much of it you want in terms of the base. If the object goes all the way around the base, you just want it to go from 0 to 2 pi. But if you only wanted half of it or some such, then you would only take part of that theta, and so maybe it would only go from 0 to pi. So that's the formula. Function, rho squared, sine phi, d rho, d phi, d theta. Right, and I probably gave you some pictures, but I don't think I explained how this whole formula comes from. This is a question. I want to evaluate this with, with respect to volume, where that region that I'm integrating over is the unit ball, meaning one unit in every direction. Why do we need to know that it's the unit ball? Because that will tell us some of the limits of integration. All right, well, the first thing I know is that rho squared equals x squared plus y squared plus z squared. So that's an easy substitution to get rid of that big piece in the middle. All right. How about limits of integration? Well, maybe we could set up these limits of integration as we go along. So let's write out the formula first. 
And I got a triple integral. And how does that triple integral go? That triple integral goes the function, which in this case is just going to be rho squared. So rho squared to the 5 halves times rho squared again times the sine of phi, and then I integrate d rho, d phi, d theta. The phi's, that's how far this ball leans off the axis, right? That's the angle. The maximum that can be is pi, because if it goes from here all the way down there, all the way to the other side, that's pi. It's not going to go past that point. So the phi's are going to go from 0 to pi. All right, so let's look at some limits of integration. That phi is going to be a distance. What's the maximum distance if you've got a unit ball, right? You've got this sphere that's sitting out here that's one unit. Well, what's the maximum distance between the center and a point on the outside? It's got to be one. So that phi has limits of integration that go from zero to one. I'm oh, sorry, that rho goes from zero to one. The phi, how big is the angle that it leans at, right? Phi is that angle that leans from the z-axis. Well, the most that it can lean is pi, right? After a while, it sort of flips back on itself. So those limits of integration are zero to pi. And then the thetas, well, you want it to go all the way around the xy plane, so that goes from zero to two pi. You realize here that we could make life a little bit easier on ourselves by taking, that should be a five, by, by taking these limits of integration and flipping them. In other words, if I put the d phi first, that'll get rid of the trig, and then all I'll have to worry about is that rho. So let's try that. Let's put, if I take p squared to the 5 halves power, I just get p to the fifth, and now multiply that by p squared, that'll give me rho to the seventh. So I'm going to end up with a rho to the seventh, and then what? Sine of phi. So let's do it d phi d theta d rho okay so we said the phi limits of integration went from 0 to pi the theta limits of integration went from 0 to 2 pi and the rho limits of integration went from 0 to 1 and hopefully doing it that way we'll get rid of the trig part first and then Happy times after that. Okay, let's come over here and sort of carry things along. We've got an integral on the inside that is the integral of rho to the seventh sine phi evaluated at zero and at pi. All right, and that's integrated with respect to phi. That's the first one we're going to do. So the antiderivative of sine is going to give me negative cosine. So I'll get negative rho to the seventh cosine of phi evaluated at pi and at zero. So I'll get negative rho to the seventh cosine of pi is negative one minus a negative rho to the seventh times the cosine of zero, which is one. All right, when I combine those, this actually gives me a row to the seventh. That gives me a row to the seventh. So I end up with two row to the sevenths. Good. Now, what's the next step? The next step is to integrate with respect to theta, at least the way we set it up, right? We said we're going to integrate with respect to theta second from zero to two pi. So now, integrate two rho to the seventh with respect to theta from zero to two pi. Now, 
Doesn't that look a little funny? Yeah, because my antiderivative is going to give me 2 rho to the 7th times theta evaluated at 2 pi and at 0. So I'll get 2 rho to the 7th times 2 pi minus 0, which is just 4 pi rho to the 7th. Now, why is that nice? What do we say the limits of integration for rho were? They just go from 0 to 1, d rho. Okay, so I get 4 pi rho to the 8th over 8, evaluated at 1 net 0. Right. So when I evaluate it at 1, 4 divided by 8 is, is 1 half. And so this gives me pi over 2. Done. There it is. The volume where I'm integrating that function over the unit ball. So that's how spherical coordinates work. I didn't say they were the simplest, easiest things to do, but not terrible. How can spherical coordinates help us? All right, take a look at this mess. Yes, it looks like a mess. I've got a square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared integrated dz dy dx. And I'm integrating with limits of integration that, again, involve sets of radicals. So how can I turn this into something much nicer to work with? All right, this limit of integration here is the upper limit of integration for the z's, right? So the z's are really what? They're really the top half of a sphere. All right, now look at my y's. My y's go from 0 to the square root of 4 minus x squared. Well, the square root of 4 minus x squared is just the top half of a circle. Top half of a circle with a radius of 2. Right? If I wrote it as y equals the square root of 4 minus x squared, if I squared both sides and move the x over, I'd get x squared plus y squared equals 4. Right? So it's a circle centered at the origin with a radius of 2. So y is the top half of a circle. So now, combine those things. When you combine those things, you end up with a quarter of a ball with a radius of 2. What does that mean? That means that x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 4. Or, as we can substitute now, rho squared equals 4. So rho squared equals 4, which means that rho is equal to 2. The other thing we know about the theta values is that those theta values go from theta equals 0 to theta equals pi because of this square root of 4 minus x squared. So in order to accomplish that, we're going to have to go all the way from 0 to pi. So now let's start making a list of fun facts here. The theta values, we said, went from 0 to pi. The rho values, we said, went from 0 to 2. What are we left with? We haven't said anything yet about phi. Hmm. Well, from the z-axis, this thing only is a quarter of a ball. So if you started here at the z-axis and said, I'm going to go down to the xy plane, what's the maximum that this thing can tilt from the z-axis to the xy plane? The maximum it can tilt is pi over 2. Past that, you're not in that first um, octant anymore. So that phi value goes from 0 to pi over 2. All right, so now do you understand that the other thing that we're doing is this square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared, this now becomes the square root of rho squared 
which is just row. All right, take this mess and turn it into a nice set of spherical coordinates. All right, what's our formula? Triple integral of the function, which in this case is just rho, times rho squared, sine of phi, which you can actually write that way too, d rho, d phi, d theta. All right, limits of integration. The rows we said went from 0 to 2. The phi's went from 0 to pi over 2. And the thetas went from 0 to pi. All right, so if I want to do the first integral with respect to rho, let's try it this way this time. P time, a rho times rho squared is rho to the third. So when I integrate rho to the third, I'm going to end up with rho to the fourth over four, and that sine phi just comes along for the ride because we're treating it as a constant, evaluated at rho equals two and at rho equals zero. Well, at rho equals two, I get 16 over four, which is just four. So I end up with four times the sine of phi. All right, when I put a zero in, I just get zero. Now we're going to integrate that with respect to phi from 0 to pi over 2. My antiderivative of sine is negative cosine, so I get negative 4 cosine of phi evaluated at pi over 2 and at 0. Negative 4 times the cosine of pi over 2 is just 0, minus a negative 4 times the cosine of 0, which is 1. That just gives me 4. And now this is the easy part. Right, when you integrate from 0 to pi of 4 d theta, you just get 4 pi. Right, so the setup was a little bit messy. There was a little bit of work in the background that had to be done. But do you realize that, yep, even though spherical coordinates can be a little bit messy, <laughs> trying to integrate that function with respect to x's, y's, and z's would be even messier. So in this case, spherical coordinates kind of bails us out. All right, let's just mention one more thing here. And I'm not going to do this whole example, but it is possible to find the volume for a cardioid of revolution. So if you can find solids of revolution for other shapes, why not a cardioid of revolution? So you can set it up so that you're taking a cardioid and revolving it through a region. So in this case, that region has row values that go from 0 to 1 plus cosine phi. The phi values are go given between 0 and pi and the theta between 0 and 2 pi. So that's what the cardioid of revolution looks like. Let's just set up what we have. So we're going to end up with a triple integral of the function we were given, which was 1 plus cosine of phi times the sine of phi d rho, sloppy handwriting here, sorry about that, sine of phi, d rho, d phi, d theta. What were our limits of integration? Well, it said that the rows went from 0 to 1 plus cosine of phi. The phi's went from 0 to pi. And the thetas went from 0 to 2 pi. Right, and then from there, you can do the substitutions and solve. I just wanted to show you that it is possible to evaluate these things in spherical coordinates for objects that you're not used to revolving. Right? You're used to revolving other objects, but it would be tough to revolve a cardioid in other coordinate systems besides spherical coordinates. All right, that's the end of spherical coordinates.